Well, a number of years ago, my wife Lorene and I were invited to spend a weekend in Florida. It was a, a retreat just for pastors and their wives, a marriage weekend. And we were all excited about it because it was taking place in February uh, and all winter long. We had been just looking forward to three days away from emails and, and ministry meetings and leadership. We had four young kids at the time and we we're going to be kind of free from the parenting thing as well. Just three days to focus on each other, to be together, and to be in the warm South Florida sun. Uh, so you can imagine our excitement. We get to the airport. And we get uh, through the gate and onto the plane, and uh, she had a window seat, and I had a middle seat, and no one was sitting in the aisle seat. And I don't know if, how well you know me, but those who know me well know I have kind of this, this personal space thing. And I, I like my space. And I was really hoping that, that that seat would stay empty, because then we could have our, our, our little cocoon of happiness. Right here, window seat, middle seat, just the two of us on a marriage weekend. And it was like that until just before they shut the door of the plane, one more lady got on. And I was, you know, I was sending signals like, <laughs> and she walked straight to our row, checked her, her, her boarding pass, and sat right in that seat. So, I had no choice, but I had to start sending immediate, unmistakable, nonverbal signals that I wasn't interested in conversation. I was in my cocoon of happiness here. I dropped my tray table, took out my, my notes, and started working on some sermon stuff, projecting an invisible psychic force field that said, please don't try to talk to me. It couldn't have been more clear if I'd hung a do not disturb sign on my left ear, all right? But it took about 30 seconds, I promise, 30 seconds for this lady, whose name turned out to be Betty, uh, she invaded my cocoon of happiness. So, you on vacation? She said in a voice that was way too perky. Okay? So, you on vacation? I resisted the urge to say, until now. I didn't say that. <laughs> I responded with sort of a polite, reserved, sort of, we're going to a conference, and looked right back at my notes. And it didn't slow her down whatsoever. She said, conference, really? What kind of conference? That's nice. What kind of conference? And my wife, who knows me very well, she leaned out from her seat trying to rescue me. And she said, uh, we're going to a marriage conference. Well, that didn't work either. Betty says, oh, a marriage conference. Wow, uh, my husband and I have been married for 17 years. That's a long time, right? 17 years. You know what I mean? I mean it hasn't been easy either. You know, we've had some pretty tough times. I'll tell you what, 17 years. Now, I'm not proud of this. But I'm thinking to myself, this is just great. All I want is three days away with my wife in my cocoon of happiness, and I'm sitting next to a pathological talker with marriage problems, right? <laughs> my wife then leans out and says, so are you on vacation? I'm like, no, no, don't, that's like throwing gas on a fire, don't encourage it. And then Betty said this, I'm going to spend a week from, with my mother in Florida because we're putting our dog to sleep this week, and it's just too sad for me. I had to get away. We've had him 16 years. He was our baby. Want to see a picture? <laughs> now, I am not making this up, okay? I'm not in my cocoon of happiness. I'm not getting my sermon work done. I'm looking at pictures of Betty's dog, okay? Then Betty said her dog was special to her because she and her husband had not been able to have children, and her only pregnancy ended in a miscarriage, and as she said this, her voice began to tremble and her eyes filled with sadness. And right about then, God spoke. Not out loud, just sort of inside me. And here's what he said. Psst! <laughs> Knucklehead. Here's a woman who's filled with sadness, desperately trying to talk to someone. And I've arranged in my sovereignty to give her a seat next to an ordained pastor with advanced degrees in pastoral counseling, <laughs> whose wife has a master's in clinical psychology. Do you think you can get with the program? He didn't say it exactly like that, but he said it something like that. We'll come back to Betty in just a moment. But I start with her story because I, Betty, I think, helps me and helps us understand the great story we look at today. All year long, we've been preaching about the story of Jesus. If you missed any of these messages that started way back at the end of August, go to our website, fpcg.com. We've archived them all. 
It's been a great journey through the Gospels. And today we finish a series that we've called Behold the Man, looking at the last week of Jesus' earthly life that was summarized for you in the little video we started the service with. And today we look at the very center of the story of Jesus, the very center of our faith as Christians, the story without which there is no Christianity, the story without which there is no church, the story without which there is no hope of eternal life, The story is about the resurrection of Christ from the dead. I'm going to read from John chapter 20 today. I'm going to read through the story. And along the way, I'm going to stop several times to sort of point out points of interest that we can sometimes miss because of our distance from the story. And then we're going to look at why the story matters to us today. So John chapter 20 begins like this. Now, on the first day of the week, which in that culture was Sunday, To us, the first day of the week is Monday, but because Saturday was the Sabbath, the day of worship, Sunday was the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Let me pause there. If you were able to visit Jerusalem today, uh, you would see that there's a great massive church called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre built right over the site that's traditionally viewed as the site of both the cross and Jesus' tomb. It's a massive church. And if you went inside the church, you could stand in line and look into uh, a place where they believe uh, once was the tomb of Jesus Christ. Now, it's very difficult to see, and you have to stand in a long line because there's ornate decorations covering everything in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. But many people believe that's the site. But there's an alternative site discovered 100 or so years ago outside the city walls, believed by some to be the hill called Golgotha, which is translated the place of the skull. You can kind of see why you would, people would think this is the hill called the skull, right? And close by is a place called the Garden Tomb, an alternative site for the location of Jesus' tomb. And this w- kind of looks more like what you think it would look like in your mind, but nobody really knows exactly where the location was. Now Mary Magdalene had come to finish anointing Jesus' body for burial because they hadn't been able to finish that task on Friday evening because the Sabbath began at sundown and had to stop that sort of preparation. But here we see the first interesting thing, and we can kind of miss this in, this in our culture. We see that the first eyewitness to the empty tomb in the Gospels is a woman. Now, in our culture, that doesn't sound that strange. But in that culture, that would have been very shocking for a reader or someone listening to the story. Because anyone in their right mind, any writer making up a story would never put the most important news into the eyewitness testimony of a woman. It's just what you didn't do in that time. Now Magdalene had been uh, healed by Jesus earlier in his ministries, was one of the women who followed him during his ministry, but still, it's a shocking thing to see the first eyewitness is a woman. Verse 2, so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, uh, the one whom Jesus loved, that's John's way of referring to himself, he's the writer here, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they've laid him. Here we see the second interesting thing. Even though Jesus has talked with his disciples and followers openly at least three times about his coming death and resurrection, their first assumption is that his body has been stolen from the tomb. And by the way, um, in the recently released movie Risen, which I recommend highly, by the way, if you've not seen it, it's a great conversation starter. Uh, The story is presented uh, very accurately. It's a very interesting uh, movie. Uh, It's all about the search for Jesus' body. How can the power of Rome not find a single body? Because the whole story would have ended at that point in time. Because the assumption was somebody had stolen the body. Verse 3. So Peter went out with the other disciple, again that's John, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Here's the third interesting thing. A small, seemingly insignificant detail. John runs faster than Peter. It's just in the story. Now, it could have been because he was younger. It could have been because he was just in better shape. Maybe he ran track in high school. We don't really know. But it doesn't serve any purpose other than a little factual detail that just seems like it's authentic. Personally, I think this is John's way of writing. When he wrote down the story, he was poking fun at his great friend Peter. Never forget, Peter, I got there first. Verse 5, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, 
but he did not go in. Now here's a view inside the garden tomb, outside of Jerusalem. Now this would be a typical uh, stone tomb of the day. You can clearly see where the place where a, a body could have been laid inside the tomb. Verse 6, then Simon Peter came following him, and he went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folding up in a place by itself. More detail there. And by the way, this is what many scholars and uh, scientists believe to be the Shroud of Turin, uh, which is this ancient burial cloth that bears the image of a crucified man. If you haven't done any interesting reading lately, Look it up on the internet. Read about the Shroud of Turin. Very, very interesting. Verse 8. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Here's the fourth interesting thing. Even seeing the empty tomb, Peter and John didn't fully yet understand. But notice it says Peter believed even though he didn't fully understand the scriptures. I think that's important. Because you may be here today, and you may have lots of questions about the Bible. You may have lots of questions even about this part of the story. How is that really possible? I'm a, I'm a science student in college. How do you expect me to really believe that? You may have lots of questions. But this part of the story tells me it's possible to believe with your heart without understanding all the answers to your questions. Verse 10, then the disciples went back to their homes, just like that. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And here's the... Last interesting thing, the resurrected Jesus appears not to one of the disciples, not to one of his inner set of followers, not to a man at all. Again, Jesus makes his first resurrection appearance to a woman. If this story were created out of someone's imagination in the first century, in that culture, there's no way they would have put his first appearance to a woman because in that culture, that appearance would not have counted and wouldn't have been trustworthy. This is the way it happened. Now we get to the heart of the story. Verse 15. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener. Now she doesn't recognize him right away, either out of shock and surprise or it's early morning light. She can't see quite clearly. She said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. So, here we stand at the most important single event in all of human history, the resurrection of a man from the dead, and Jesus asked two questions. Why are you weeping and whom are you seeking? I was thinking about that this week, and now you'd think he would say, Mary, look, it's me. I'm back. I did everything I said I would do. Isn't it amazing? That's what I would have said. But he doesn't. He asks two questions. Why? I think maybe because he knows that even his resurrection only matters if it answers these two fundamental questions of human existence. First, why are you weeping? We ended up talking to Betty on that airplane. Or more accurately, she talked to us for the entire three-hour flight to Florida. At one point, after I had mentioned something about church, I can't remember exactly how, she said, so are you like a, are you like a minister or something? And I'm always nervous when that subject comes up in conversation with strangers because as soon as I say I'm the pastor at a Baptist church, the whole conversation changes sometimes. But this one changed for the better when she found that out. She actually got very interested in spiritual things, and she was very interested. She ended up talking so much that my, my neck was like stuck in this position because it was just nonstop. We found out this is a woman who had experienced great pain 
in her life. Great sadness. The struggles in her marriage produced loneliness. The loss of her only pregnancy produced unresolved grief and disappointment. She looked to her dog of 16 years for companionship and comfort, and now even he was gone. Early on, she had looked to her church tradition for hope and found only, in her words, coldness, disinterest, and judgment. She had many, many reasons to weep. The truth is we all have reasons to weep. Every parent knows what it is to hear a young child suddenly burst into tears. You run into where they are and you scoop them up and say, why are you crying? Show me where it hurts. And when they're four or five years old, it might just be a skinned knee. When they're 10 or 12, it might be a broken bone. When they're 16 or 18, it might be a broken heart. As we grow older, we get more and more adept at hiding our pain, hiding our sadness, hiding our tears. But if I ask a room this size, why do you weep? If you were honest, I'd get a different answer for every person in the room. Because we all carry our burdens, maybe physical pain or sickness. And any given week, our staff has a list of prayer concerns, up to a dozen people or more, most of them experiencing physical discomfort, pain, disease. Some relational or emotional pain. Or maybe your tears may be more about failure or shame or disappointment. Remember Peter? Three times in one night, he denied he even knew Jesus. The Bible says he wept bitterly that night. For Betty, her disappointment, her pain was the loss of her dog, but that just covered a deeper pain the loss of a child that she had not been able to fully grieve, personal loss. We had over 10 funerals in our church family since the fall. And there's something about standing with a family to watch as they watch a loved one slip away or standing next to a casket as it's lowered into the ground that just makes you scream out, there's got to be more than this. There's got to be more. So Mary is weeping at the tomb of Jesus. Her grief is real. She's lost her great friend. She's lost her teacher, the one who changed her life from the inside out. Her despair is real. Her faith has been shattered. Her hope is crushed. So the question stands today, why do you weep? What losses do you grieve? What wounds do you carry secretly within you? What causes you to be afraid or anxious or ashamed? The resurrection of Jesus brings hope to our tears. First of all, because he knows our pain. Way back in the prophet Isaiah chapter 53, we read, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as from one As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Despised and rejected. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Jesus was the one who wept at the death of his friend Lazarus. He was the one who was betrayed and abandoned by his own friends. He was the one who cried from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was the one who died rejected humiliated, and alone. And so he knows. He understands. When we have a friend or a loved one who is suffering, it's, it's just human instinct to want to say to them, hey, hey, I, I, I know how you feel, when deep down we know we really don't. But there is one who always knows what it is to feel what we feel, and his name is Jesus. Secondly, because the resurrection brings hope to our hopelessness. Mary is lost in her tears and hopelessness until she hears him speak her name, Mary. And it's when he speaks her name that she knows he's alive and her hope returns. We're here this evening because we believe that he knows our names. He knows your name. He knows where it hurts. He knows why you weep. His resurrection brings hope because if that's true, it means that this life is not all there is. It means that even death is not the final word. His resurrection tells us that even though our tears say things ought to be different, the resurrection tells us one day will come when they will be different because he makes us that promise. And that leads us to the second question that Jesus asks, which is whom 
are you seeking? Why do you weep and whom are you seeking? One of our enduring family stories in our house has to do with something that happened at bedtime um, many years ago when our boys were much, much younger. I was uh, in one of the bedrooms putting our two older boys to bed, having already put the two younger ones to bed in their room. And as I was putting the older ones to bed, one of the younger brothers, who's only about two and a half the time, burst into the room of the older boys. And I was a little surprised and kind of irritated because he was supposed to be sleeping already in his bed because I'd already put him to bed. And it slowed everything down to have him come back in. So I looked and said, what do you need? And he, he looked at me and said, made a mess, Daddy. Made a mess. I said, go back to your room. I'll be there in a minute. And as he turned around to walk away, something piqued my curiosity. I said, uh, what kind of mess? His eyes got big, and he went, with a fish. <laughs> and that got my attention. So I quickly put these, these two to bed, ran into his room, and I saw what had happened. He had pushed a chair over to uh, a, a bookcase where we had a single little bowl, fish bowl, that had one, exactly one fish in it that was their pet fish. It was an angelfish, creatively named Angel. <laughs> angel the angelfish. And he had tried to feed the fish, but he had accidentally dumped an entire canister of fish food into the tank. As I looked at it, there was an inch-thick sludge of fish food floating on the surface of the water. And I looked underneath, and Angel the angelfish was underneath it, just gulping down flakes as fast as possible. And I'm not a marine biologist, but that didn't look like it was good to me. So I did what I, what I could to scoop off all the, the fish food sludge and so forth and put my son to bed rather abruptly, as I recall. Uh, and in the morning, I went in to check, and Angel the Angelfish was alive, but a little sluggish looking. By the next evening, Angel the Angelfish was floating on the water, and I had to break the news to my boys that their fish had succumbed to complications, I think due to overeating, and we had to conduct a little bathroom burial at sea, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Somewhere in that story, there is a parable of all human life. My little boy had a problem. He'd created a mess that he couldn't clean up by himself. He came in looking for help. And the same thing is true for every single one of us. We have a mess that we can't clean up by ourselves. Only the mess isn't about fish food. Betty's mess was about loss and loneliness and despair. Peter's mess was about fear and denial and shame. And so what's your mess about today? I have a mess. You have a mess. We look so many places for help. We watch Dr. Phil. We watch Dr. Oz. We change our diet. We go to the next exercise plan. Uh, we... we do all these things, and none of them are bad, but they, none, of, they, none of them touch the deepest parts of our souls. There's no end to the ways we try to numb ourselves to the pain and messes of our lives. We, we, we eat too much food, we drink too much drink, we take drugs, we look to sex, we look to work, we look to entertainment, anything to cover it up. Some of us look to relationships, maybe series of relationships. Fifty years ago, the Beatles sang a song called Eleanor Rigby. Some of you know the song by heart. Ah, look at all the lonely people, they said. Where do they all come from? All the lonely people, where do they belong? Google tells us the most frequent searches at night on computers are loneliness, depression, and suicide. So we look for relationships, someone to make us feel less lonely, someone to help us clean up the mess of our lives. Mary says, tell me where you've taken him. She's still looking for a body that she can anoint. And then Jesus says simply, Mary. He speaks her name, and in her, hearing her name spoken, she knows him, and she knows she's not alone. She knows her mess can be cleaned up. Make no mistake. The center of our faith is not the moral and ethical teachings of Jesus. Those are good, but they're not the center of our faith. The center of our faith is not Jesus feeding the hungry or having compassion on the poor or healing the sick. Those are all good things, but that's not the center of our faith. The center of our faith is death and resurrection. The gospel writers tell us that within a matter of a few hours and a few days, in Luke 24, Jesus walks with two men on the road to Emmaus. He explains the scriptures to them. 
And then they recognize him in that evening at the breaking of the bread. And they say to one another, did not our hearts burn within us? Because he was with them. John tells us that eight days later, he appeared to them in a locked room and said, peace be with you. And he showed them his hands and his side. He allowed Thomas to touch his hands and his side, to touch his wounds. And when he did, Thomas fell on his knees and said, my Lord and my God, because he was with them. In John 21, the disciples returned to fishing. Jesus is on the shore. He calls out to them, throw the nets on the right side of the boat. They make an enormous catch and they realize it's him. He actually fries up some of the fish and makes them breakfast. They share together because he's with them. And finally, in Matthew chapter 28, before leaving them for the last time, he says, and surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. You see, the resurrection was not an imaginary event created by a group of fanatical followers of a deranged messianic figure. That's what much of the world would have us believe. The story is written off while it was just a fanatical few who just hallucinated. The resurrection was an explosion of life and hope and joy that shattered death into a million pieces and transformed broken and fearful men and women into bold and courageous witnesses, eyewitnesses, to the gospel. And because of their witness, we are here today. I've told stories about my dad many times for many reasons. This is one of my favorites. He was born in 1933, the youngest of six children. When he was only five years old, his father died suddenly leaving his mother to care for six children in post-depression America and small-town America. The summer after his father died, his mother sent him to live with relatives on a small farm away from the small town in which they lived in rural Illinois. And she did it because it was the only way she could guarantee her youngest would have enough food to eat that summer. Now, being as young as he was, he didn't understand all that. He's just six years old or so. He, all he knows was he was in a different place, away from his family, his dad wasn't around, and he was lonely. He has very, very few memory, memories of this time in his life, but he does remember finishing his farm chores in the morning every day that summer and then walking out to the country road in front of the farm where he would sit. He knew his older brother, Bill, had a job driving a milk truck. He was a senior in high school, driving a milk truck. So my dad at age six would go out and sit by the country road and wait all day, hoping that his brother would drive by and that he could wave and feel a little less lonely. He did that every day. And his brother never came by. It wasn't his route. Much of my dad's early life was just like that. Sad, unspeakably lonely, and without much hope. But when he was 15, two of his high school football buddies invited him to go with them to hear a Methodist preacher preached the gospel. And that night, my dad heard Jesus speak his name when he was 15. And on that night, Jesus not only saved my dad, but gave him a sense of identity, security, and hope that completely transformed his life. And from that day forward, going upwards of 70 years now, my father has never been lonely again. And that's what he'll tell you. From that day forward, he knew he was loved. He knew he was forgiven. He knew he was not forgotten. And he knew that even death could not quench the hope that was within him. And so tonight there are two questions. Why do you weep? What's the mess look like that you need help with? And who are you looking for to clean that up? This story tells us that he is here and that he speaks your name and his name is Jesus for he is risen. Hallelujah, he is risen. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, how we thank you for the story we celebrate today and how our hearts burn within us 
at the sound of you speaking our names. Not out loud, but deep within our souls. You are the one who knows us by name. You are the one who knows our deepest pains. You are the one who knows the mess of our lives. And by your living spirit, may we hear your voice. And may we know your love, your grace, and your life. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.